Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How are you today? You're good. How are the groups going? Have everyone uh, found their groups and have you had meetings already or? You international students, have you found your groups? Yeah, that's good. Today we are going to talk about volunteerism. We've been talking about uh, sports, organized sports, the voluntary sports sector. And obviously, in a voluntary sports sector, there needs to be volunteers. In our structure in Norway, volunteerism is a very important um, aspect, or it's an important part of our sports organization. Uh, so today we're going to talk about volunteerism. The agenda is this. First of all, we're talking about social capital. We will come back to what that is. And volunteering. Then we have Oskar Solnes. He's the dean I'm at our department. I think you all know him, right? Oskar? Yeah. Uh, he has, uh, together with Halger, the principal, they've done a, a research project on volunteering in recurring events, in such as uh, at the stadium, football, uh, uh, recurring football games, for instance. And he will talk a little bit about that um, and their research. He will be here quarter to 10, so there might be a little bit of adjustment on the plan. And then we're going to talk about the management of voluntary sport organizations, how to recruit volunteers. Because as I've said many times, that's probably one of the biggest challenges for volunteer organizations. It's not the same to manage volunteers as it is to manage fully employed people that get wages. You can actually demand things. For volunteer, management is different. And then at the end, we're having a, a, grou a group assignment. And the point is uh, for you to, I'm giving you a specific research question. And I want you to uh, work on this uh, as if you were doing a, a thesis. Or um, I know that most of you are going to write a bachelor thesis one day. May maybe some of you have already. Then you'll have to work on, on how to, how to um, for instance, post questions. So we're going to work on that in the last part. I just have to ask, is th do, you, do, your, do you have your methods now? Yeah? At the same time as him. So that's good. It's also relevant for that course then, your methods course. After class, you should be able to define social capital. How can it be measured? How do we measure someone's social capital? Define volunteering. Um, and then, yeah, following the agenda, how to manage volunteers in voluntary organizations. And on the plan, we use Putnam, Österlund, and Vollebeck. And there will also be reference to some other articles uh, discussing volunteering. Volunteering is a huge topic, actually. We could have had a, an own course with only talking about volunteering. So to try to narrow it down to a couple of, uh, couple of hours lecture is quite challenging, in a sense, because I don't know. <laughs> um, how much is enough to get a little sense of what this is all about. But um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to do that. But first, I want to ask you, how many of you are members of organizations? Some sort of organizations? Yeah? How, mem how many are members of more than one organization? Yeah? Any organization, not only sports organizations can be anything. Supporter clubs, for instance. More than one? More than two? More than three? Maybe not. When I was thinking myself, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm a member of that, and of that, and of that. So, but um, I think it's quite, um, uh, what can I say? Um, not relevant, but it's quite similar to the rest of our population. Most of us are m probably members, but not in very many things. 
um, at least or very many different organizations. And this guy Putnam that we have on our, um, on our um, reading list, he wrote a book in 2000 called Bowling Alone. This is, of course, an old book now. It's uh, 15 years old. But what he measures uh, is what he uh, think is a decline of what is called social capital in America, meaning that less and less people are members of organizations. Less and less people organize. Um, and why is this a problem? In his terms, talking about social capital, when less and less people organize, we are, and we are uh, less and less um, in networks. Organizations are networks, important networks that structure our society. And the less we organize, the less we're part of these networks. And Putnam says that this is a problem because uh, if, we, if, we, um, if we don't organize and our social capital, as I will explain in the next slides, if this, the social capital goes down, uh, it does something with our productivity. In working together in groups, we are more productive. Having a, a big network, I'm not just talking about having like uh, 2,000 Facebook friends or something, but having like these networks of, of uh, people that you actually meet, it's important. And that's Putnam's point. As we organize less, these networks are weaker. And that might do something with the structures of society. We have touched a bit upon the capital uh, concept before. Do you know the capital concept, the concept of capital? You French guys probably know it because it's uh, French sociologists are very, <laughs> what do you say, uh, the founding fathers probably. Bourdieu, you know Bourdieu? Yeah, yeah. he was uh, maybe not the founding father of the capital concept, but he developed it. And we talk about capital as something you have. If we have a financial capital, that say, goes for itself, right? You have a, quite a lot of money. And then we can have, we, we talk about cultural capital. Have you heard that before? Culturel capital, cultural capital. Uh, then you have um, a high, um, high amount <laughs> of cultural um, value, in a sense, not value. If you read a lot of books and if you, if you know a lot about different types of music and you, you go frequently to movie theaters and regular theater, theaters, you might, you have a higher social, no, uh, cultural capital. So capitals tell us something about how much we have of something. And it's an, uh, it's an interesting concept that sociologists use a lot to maybe not group people, but in a sense, they do that. Um, they're also talking about symbolic capital, uh, and uh, which is more of a what what ma what are values to people? If you have a high symbolic um, capital. When we talk about social capital, as it says here, it refers to connection among individuals, your networks, and the norms of reciprocity. You know reciprocity, the concept? To give something back, yeah? And trustworthiness that arises from them. So if you have a, s a high social capital, you probably have a high or, or a large network or large groups of people that you somehow relate to. It's not that you have a lot of friends necessarily, but you, you are in different... Um, yeah, in different uh, environments. Um, and what are the benefits of being in different environments and have high social capital? Is, it, is that important? For society. 
for yourself it might be important because you feel you feel well maybe when you have a lot of acquaintances and people that know you and being a person that everyone knows might be cool but but is that important yeah some of you nod <laughs> it might be important um, because as I was already saying it leads to the more people know each other the easier it is to for instance ask people about something uh, the more productive we are um, there's this uh, I read in the newspaper if we take more of a social uh, social benefit I read in the newspaper there was a group of parents that had this project in Bergen a town south, uh, southern south of us and they had a project against bullying in school um, and uh, or serious bullying in school so they were thinking okay if our networks if our parent networks are strengthened if we actually know each other as parents then our children prob probably won't bully each other you get that if our networks are stronger if we know each other it's more difficult to do bad things we know the people we know we want well with or we want well for so that might be an easy example but uh, a way that social capital increased social capital can be good and there are many many examples all these words here I just uh, found them on the internet but it's a it's a um, they have keywords of what social capital might be, wha what are important words or what are important aspects of, of uh, social capital. Group membership, trust is in a very important part of it. Networking, friends, empowerment, etc., etc. But if I should challenge you, do you have something to write on, most of you? Um, if you were to measure social capital, say you were going to measure social capital in a group of people how would you do that what kind of ac uh, questions would you ask say you were to make a um, a research project you're measuring social capital try to write down four or five questions what would you ask someone to measure someone's social capital Har du ingenting att skriva med eller på? Ah. Ja. Grubbla lite.
Okay. Does anyone want to say what they wrote? What types of questions do we ask people about their social capital? You can say it in Norwegian if you like, and then I can translate. Anyone? Yeah? How well do you know your classmates? That's a, a way to measure social capital. Anything else? How many social stages? Yeah, Different. Different. Yeah. And then a uh, follow up, follow up question. Uh, do you feel that you have strong contacts within these groups? Do you feel that you have strong contacts within this group? Yeah. Just as, an, uh, as a general point, and that which also relates to what you're going to do at the end, uh, these um, questions where you have to s measure or scale sometimes is um, it's difficult because mine and yours feeling of something might be very different. So when you, just on a general note, if you do, if you make a questionnaire, for instance, trying to be as specific as possible is often smart, because then people are like, yeah, I know people, but how much is much, for instance? Anyone else? Yeah? You do volunteer work, yeah? And if you're organized, good. You would ask how many organizations, probably, what types of organization these are. Anyone else? I actually wanted to, to find a questionnaire uh, to, to let you see, see one and test yourselves, in a sense. But I, was <laughs> I wasn't able to, to find one uh, unless I had to make it myself. Uh, but I, I uh, looked at the on the online and found a few research projects. And here are one, here is one for instance, where they ask, do you know anyone who, and then one, can repair a car, owns a car, can work with a computer, etc., etc., owns a holiday home abroad? And by answering these questions, it will show us a little bit about your network, who you are. Okay, you know, actually know someone in government. And you also know someone who can um, knows about soccer or can babysit for your children. So there are lots of ways to measure this, and uh, also in, in in posing these questions, there are of obviously a lot of ways to do that. And um, we will look at it later. Putnam distinguishes between what he calls bonding capital and bridging capital. Bridging social capital and bonding social capital. And this bonding capital, or what we also can call exclusive capital, is when you are socializing with people who are like you. The same age, the same race, the same gender, um, the same religion, etc., etc. Not all of these together necessarily. Um, if, you, if you're socializing with people with the same age, it will also be a kind of a bonding capital. Exclusive capital in the sense that, that uh, if you're not like that particular group, uh, you wouldn't fit in. Um, what examples of bonding capital? Student unions, for instance. People there are more or less the same. Of course, there are individuals with different tastes and requirements, but there is something there that connects them, that excludes other people. And then you have the bridging capital, which is inclusive, which, I which are uh, networks, a gathering of people uh, where you are socializing with people who are not like yourself, but you might have this uh, common interest. Um, for instance, if you are a member of the Red Cross, 
You have a common interest, but there are people from all parts of the society. You don't have to, you don't have to be a specific age, or unless you're in the in a specific group within this specific uh, network. Um, you say that the bonding capital is good for getting by because it feel, makes you feel good to be in a group of people with similar interests, for instance. Um, but if you're in this group, it's good for getting ahead. If you, wanna, if you want a job, if you're applying for a job, if you know people outside your near little group of, uh, of network or your, or your near network, it's easier to know people, to have a big network. It's good for getting ahead. And then you need both these capitals. But the bonding capitals uh, might be feel good for you or better for you, whereas this is also important. So this is also an important distinguishing uh, in Gutman. How then about the trends in America that he's talking about? Because, as I said, Putnam is worried about the social capital. He's worried that since people are less organized, the social capital is going down. The active involvement is going down. People are organized, but they say uh, the tertiary associates and tertiary uh, organizations. Your members on a mailing list. You get emails and you reply on these. Or SMS. I, I'm an amnesty activist. I get SMSs and then I just reply. I'm a member, but but I never meet the other members. I don't know who they are. And as this grows and this turns lower, the social this doesn't increase my social capital. It might make me feel good if I do something that is good, <laughs> but I never meet the other ones. I have no idea who they are, so it's not a part of my network. In America, this is in America, also the social encounters are declining. How many of you have, in the previous week, just randomly popped by and visited a friend? For no specific reason, just hanging out. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> the trends are, and I think, I don't have research on this, but I, my, uh, I assume that this is more or less the same in Norway. We visit each other, uh, each other less than we, they did. <laughs> I can say they, because I, I don't visit people <laughs> either that much. And of course, this is also depending on where you are in your life. If you're a kid, of course, you visit your friends all the time. But as we go, grow older, these social encounters are declining. And that is also not very positive for our social capital. Those informal meetings just hanging out, doing nothing. He's talking about card games, meeting for card games. Um, and bowling. <laughs> we don't do that as much. In America, I don't think this is the same in Norway, but less people are doing sport, or at least the arrow is changing in Norway now. Less people are doing sports, uh, and they spend more time watching sports. And that's not on the sports arena where you actually have a network, but that is on TV or... or uh, on uh, internet. And that is also watching sports on online or on TV doesn't do much for your social network. Maybe there are chat rooms, etc., that you can that you can use, but watch Yeah. And then that will be a part of this as well. And that you probably do more often. But his main point is that social networks are declining and we need to reconnect and meet physically. We need to be more social because that benefits society. It's not only, your, uh, only for your individual gain, but it's actually for the gain of the society. And then as I read this article or this book, again, I was thinking, okay, how relevant is this? Because now we have a whole new generation of people on the internet. And that is so different. I mean, when he, d he wrote this, uh, Facebook, for instance, wasn't invented. Uh, he said that uh, internet wouldn't benefit the social capital. It would m probably make us uh, narrower. Or he, of course, he wasn't sure, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't benefit. But now researchers show that, of course, that's not 
necessarily right. Uh, people are social online. Um, and there is a new way of being social now. We don't know whether or not, oh, you don't meet uh, necessarily physically. But, um, but this network and this capital, this, what this does to your social capital shouldn't be underestimated, researchers say. But there is a lot of, uh, uh, what do you say? Un there is a request for more research on this specific topic because. Um, but it might be a new way of involving. How many of you used to press like when you see things uh, from organizations that pops up on your feed? You sometimes do, yeah? Maybe there is uh, a very important cause and click you like. But is like, is to like something active involvement in an organization? What does that do for the organization? The Cancer Association, if I press like on something, doesn't do anything, really, but it's important for them still. But um, it's a whole different way of being active. So, um, and of course, this relates to what we're going to talk about when it comes to volunteering. Yeah. It's a good point. Very good point. At least it, it uh, gives publicity to the cause. I'm not saying that it's, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's not good, but it's a whole way of, or different way of being involved. Then, um, but I would also say just uh, uh, in, uh, in relation to the United States, because maybe together with Northern Europe, but uh, but the United States has a, a very very strong volunteer uh, culture, and even stronger, in my opinion or in my feeling, you shouldn't say feeling, but <laughs> uh, then in Norway maybe when it comes to volunteering, in for instance, uh, you have all these uh, groups of uh, elderly or church groups or uh, yeah, you that lived in America, you know what I'm talking about anyway. But it's, um, and there's a strong culture, has been a very strong culture. And that is, as he says, on, in, uh, on decline. So what is volunteering? Any activity in which time is freely given to benefit another person, group, or cause. In Norway or Norwegian, we have a word called dugnad. And we always have problems in explaining what dugnad is. I already said that word, I think. And dugnad is not exactly the same as volunteerism or volunteering. It is to do voluntary work, but it's not really, it's given freely to benefit another group of, or cause. But usually why we do dugnad is because somehow, for instance, our club earns money from us doing this. Or uh, the, um, the opposite would be to buy someone or uh, pay someone to do the same thing as we do. So there is freely and it's voluntary, but at the same time, not exactly the same. And we discussed it here in the office, Oscar and I, and we, we couldn't really get a hold on what this really is. So what is um, the difference? There is a, uh, a difference, but Hi, Oscar. It's more conceptual. Perfect timing. After this slide, I will uh, let you. Um, I will let you talk. Putnam's point is that people belonging to these social networks that we talked about are more likely to do voluntary work than those who are socially isolated. And also that volunteering increases the social capital. Uska, I think uh, I will let you talk now because you also have this uh, background on your presentation. Okay, and I just have to... Uh, 
Ja, but then I can uh, kanskje ta neste slide her, here. <laughs> because when Oscar prepares, I want you to think, why do you volunteer? If you volunteer, why do you volunteer? Make a list of some points and then you try to prioritize. Which is the most important reason for you to volunteer? Uh, Karsten was here uh, talking about, for instance, these youth networks. And if you were to volunteer here, what would be the main reason for you to volunteer? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So why do you volunteer? Make a list of five if you if you manage and then give me the most important reasons for volunteering. Sorry, I don't worry. Yeah. 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 Skal vi diskutere litt, eller skal vi bare... Ja. I'll give you another three minutes to discuss uh, Solveig's question here, and then we will pick up on this one, okay? So continue your discussion. So three to five more minutes. <coughs>
Okay, um, then I think we'll continue. Um, it was a bit unfortunate that uh, I just have to drop into your class like this, but uh, I have to run to a board meeting if I'm called upon. So I, uh, so this was the most convenient time for us uh, to join in um, because I'm. I'm here to tell you about a research project that we have conducted. Uh, some colleagues from uh, from us, me and, uh, and Holger Gammersetter, who is a professor in sport management, but at the moment he's the rector at High uh, School in Molde. So um, he is not very involved in the research and the program at the moment, but uh, he's part of the staff. So we have conducted a, a research on, on uh, the volunteers in what we call recurring events. And more specifically, we have um, done a qualitative study on the volunteers at Norwegian football, uh, professional football matches. So the event uh, taking place every, every second week on Aker Stadion here in Molde or in uh, Line Stadion in Ålesund or Ullevål Stadion in Oslo or, or whatever. So we have interviewed some of these volunteers trying to understand um, why they are doing this, why are they, why are they volunteers and, and uh, trying to understand what, how they understand their, their, uh, their practice, their social practice, why they do this. Sulwai will come more into, you have just started on, on talking about what is volunteerism and how Putnam understands it. So, um, so then we are jumping a bit back and forth there, but hopefully you will still, at the end of this uh, lecture, you will still ha have the picture. Um, so the background here is that there is a, there is a growing focus on, on how to understand volunteers. Um, in sport and in, uh, in sport events. And we have listed up different perspectives here. I don't know whether you have talked about this already, but we can understand volunteers and volunteerism in different ways based on where they are volunteers. So for instance, being a coach in the um, child football or in the youth football is something completely different than being uh, a volunteer at at the Olympics, yeah, or in the or in the World Championship or the FIFA or or whatever. So there is a huge difference between those volunteering in grassroots sports, those being in this one-off events like the Olympics, the championships, or whatever, being a board member or a committee, which is a, a huge part of at least for some taking part in, in uh, organized sport in, um, in Norway and in, in Nordic countries as well. Being a volunteer and being a, a volunteer board member, for instance. And then, of course, you have these, the group that we have been interested in, volunteers in these recurring events. These events that are, are uh, coming up in a certain sequence. Uh, either it's each week or every second week or each month or whatever. So our background here was that these volunteers in these uh, recurring sport events, they have not been, it hasn't been conducted much research on them or nearly, they have nearly been ignored. Mainly it has been on those. This is where this is where the most of the research has been done, at least in the most of the published research the last five, ten years has been on this one. And then, at least in the 1990s, there was a, a more research on these, on these coaches. Why, why did they do this and so on and so on. So, our research question when we entered this field was, what characterizes the volunteering in recurring sport events and how can, and how can it be ex explained? So we wanted to, to check what, it, what is this, what is going on here? 
So, um, Zulwai will come more into this later on, because she would talk about uh, the ski world or the Nordic ski championship in Oslo, I guess. Um, because the key word has been motivation in many of these studies. So they have asked volunteers, they've sent out questionnaires. Why do you volunteer? What's your motivation? Why did you start? Was it your father that recruited you or was it your mother? All these questions have been asked to all, all those volunteering. What's your motivation? How could we measure motivation? This is one of the things that probably Sulwa would uh, come into. Um, is it, uh, it gives me joy? Or I get free tickets, I can see the championship. I meet interesting people. I have the possibility to work with uh, media. And I plan to work in media later on. So it, it gives me a, a, an experience. I could put it on my CV. All these different things have been part of this motivation scales, trying to understand why people do volunteer. But of course, there could be other reasons as well. Um, so throw it in here is listing up, uh, trying to make a list, short list of what has been the most um, uh, important motives according to uh, all kinds of research. And there's a, they are instrumental, they are altruistic, they are egoistic. There's a long list. And the sort of the conclusion here is that the findings diverge. They diverge a lot. Um, but the volunteers are motivated by diverse motiv motives. And they uh, could be individually, so they could vary between individuals. Or in uh, some cases, they are aggregated. So it could be all these different. All these different motives mean something to, to someone. So there is, a, there is a long list of of uh, different motivations, and hopefully Sulwai will come into that. So I skip that part in order to. Uh, so what we, our research here is sort of not saying that this other research is wrong, but we are trying. We are more into a, a sort of a slightly different research agenda based on the critique from uh, this guy, Nichols, which says that the volunteer's motivation is highly psychological. It's part of a, this psychological contract between uh, employer and employee. So we un understand this relationship between the uh, organizers and the volunteers as some sort of an, um, um, relationship between an uh, employer and um, an employee, which is not necessarily the case. Uh, and according to Nichols, in most of this research, power and power relations are ignored. Um, and there's an um, sort of an assu assumption that there is a natural cons consensus between the managers and the volunteers. So if I am the manager and you are the volunteers, you naturally respect my my power, which is not necessarily the case. Because I might be in my uh, ordinary life, I might drive around in lorry, and I will be the manager, but you are actually the director in uh, a big firm or whatever, but you just want to have the fun, so you just volunteer for this. But still, I will be your boss, and there is a different social hierarchy, and so on and so on. Which, me most of this, uh, Motivation, psychological research is not necessarily taking this into consideration. So, to conclude here, we need studies of volunteers in their social context, so that we study what the volunteers when they are actually taking part in the in the uh, 
activity and we are trying to understand not only the human, why are these people thinking the way they are, but we are also trying to understand the human being within this social environment. Yeah? So that we need to we need to understand not only why I choose to be a volunteer, but we need to understand why or how people around me understand my ac social activity, for instance, how the club respond to my uh, my activity, and so on and so on. So this social context is a is a way of trying to understand the volunteers in a more broader perspective. So what we did, we interviewed, we had a, we had a, a, sur a big survey. We sent it out questionnaires to all registered volunteers in, at that time, the 16 uh, clubs in the top division in Norway. And based, based on these uh, questionnaires, we later on picked out three clubs, three different clubs. And then we interviewed uh, altogether 16 volunteers from these three different clubs. And we asked them different questions. We had an interview between 30 minutes up till an hour where we talked about how they understand volunteerism more in general, how they understand their own activity, how they explain why they do volunteerism, why they are active within this club, uh, how and why they started up. Uh, we talked about their motivation, why do they do this, but we also talked about their relationship to the leaders, to the rest of the volunteers, to the club, etc. So what we can say about these volunteers is that each club has between 150 and 400 volunteers which are coming on more or less regular basis to participate uh, and they, this could be everything from uh, running the parking up until being the, the speaker at the stadium or running the press and media center they have all different kinds of, of uh, functions at the event. But each club has between 150 and 400. And the basic understanding in Norwegian football is that without these volunteers, without their voluntary work, these matches could not have happened. Because it would have been too expensive to, to uh, hire people to do the same amount of work as, as these volunteers would do. So uh, for each match they spend between four or five hours per event. So they will be there two hours before the match and then it's the match and then they will be there from half an hour to one and a half hour after the match. All depend on what kind of work they do. So what we did was we randomly picked among a list in these three different clubs. We picked who we wanted to interview. And uh, as you can see, there's, a, there's the list. Um, mainly men. 12 out of 16 were men. What do you think about that? Four out, that's 25% were women. Should it be 50-50 or? What do you think? Yeah? I don't think that you can be picky in volunteering. If you have 60% men or 40% women, it's the same thing because we need volunteering. So I don't think you should think so much about there is a lot of women, women and... Mm. No? Yeah. <laughs> but for us, doing a research, yeah. 
We have, sec we have 16 w uh, interviews that we conducted. Four out of these were women. Should we have picked out so that we at least had eight women? So it would be 50 50? No. Why not? Because there are less women doing volunteering in this context. So if you pick more women, then there are percentage of doing the volunteering, it would be false, if you can call it that. Mm. Yes. Yeah. You agree with her? Yeah. Sounds reasonable? Yeah. Is it too many women here then? Twenty five percent. I guess some of you are, are going to football matches in Norwegian Tipa Liga. Are there any women volunteering? You do? Yeah. I think 25% is uh, f probably a fair number. We were a bit lucky on this because it was randomly picked. So in that sense, it's, I think it's probably uh, quite representative, around 25%. There is definitely more men than women. Yeah. Yeah. This is football, yeah. Do you have, uh, have the same number in handball? Good question. <coughs> what do you think? Would, have been, uh, would uh, it have been more women volunteering in, uh, if we had d conducted the same research in team handball in Norway? Any ideas? Yeah? Possibly, yeah. I think so too, possibly. But I don't know. Actually, I've never been to a top match in Hamburg next year be, uh, when they qualify. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But the amount of volunteers would be would drop dramatically from football and into team handball, or from foot from uh, from Premier League football in Norway, and and uh, the second level, or even in women women's football. Yeah. Uh, I think they have. I don't think they have good numbers on this. They have, they have, they have some ideas based on registered uh, season ticket holders, but I, maybe. I don't think that's. Uh, it might even be more. At least in some matches, I think this will vary from 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 team to team. I guess. I am a season ticket holder in uh, at Molde Stadium and at least around me there are a lot of women and girls. That's other reasons. You know. That's other reasons. Okay, okay, I didn't around, around me, okay, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, point taken, yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. So when we did the ask these questions we try to understand uh, how they reasoned their activity, why they explained the, the way they did. And what we found out when we talked about their inroads, how they were recruited, they had very different ways into, into the volunteerism. Either through the fan club, they were supporters. It could be through other club activities they had been a board member or they had been a coach or whatever or it was through the family and they identified very differently with many of them of course identified with with the club as such but it could also be with the city or the event they wanted to have they they were proud of the event they were proud of of what they they were able to do in this small town and there is a competition between the event organizers each year to be the best organizer 
in in uh, in the football league. Yeah, and of course you have this instrumental reasoning, which in many cases were secondary: free access to matches, memorability, uh, and social events, the social life, and so on and so on. So um, I just have some quotes here. Um, just to illustrate what kind of answers we, we got. These are not their real name, of course, but Hans, who was a 72-year-old volunteer, he said that I needed something to do when my wife died. He had moved to the, city, uh, to the town uh, 10 years ago, and then his wife died, I think it was four and five years ago, and then he started to volunteer. He needed a social life. And Utta had, I always, I've always been a supporter. And now when I'm retired, I had the chance to contribute. So his inroad was through the supporter. John said, well, some like creating fly bait. I like to work for my club. For me, it's a hobby. So he compared it to any other hobbies that we might have. Either that will be fly fishing, or hunting, or jogging, or theater, or music, or whatever. For him, this was his hobby. He participated in, uh, in the club. He was, uh, he was a member of the club. He spent a lot of, he was, I think he was, yeah, he was um, uh, retired as well because of, he had some disability uh, benefits. So he spent a lot of time at, at the, at the uh, clubhouse, doing different things, being part of the club. And Elin has said, I've always been interested in football and the club, she explained. And she served eight years until my mother fell ill. After four years, I returned. Now. My husband got interested in football and I came back also because he likes to go into town to the pub before the game and have a beer. And I'm the driver. That's her, that's her rationality. That's why she volunteers. She used to volunteer. Her husband wasn't very interested, but then he got interested. He wanted to see the matches. He wanted to have this community with his supporters. So. She drives him into town, drop him off at the supporters pub. She volunteers at the stadium and then they go back. That's why she volunteers. It was a bit of a coincidence that I started as a volunteer, but it gives me something in return. It's nice to be part of it. And for me, I'm interested in football. So being a volunteer gives me the opportunity to follow my interest and experience from the inside of such an event. So here is both the social or the interest in football, which for m many of these are important, but for this guy as well, gives him the experience from the inside of such an event. Karianne has said, and that's actually one of the reasons why I participate and stand here as a host, to come out socially, to meet other people too to feel that one still can do something. In the interview, she told me that she had, five years ago, she suffered from uh, obesity. She was very heavy. And then she started to uh, do something about that. She did something with her diet. She started to work out. And a part of that, a friend of her said, you need to do something. You need to come out. You need to participate in society. And she dragged her into this volunteerism in football. And now this is how she explained her activity. This is how she understands it. So these are, you, if, if Sulwai would, she would probably show you the, the, the questionnaires or something like that, the, how we map 
motivation in these using these questionnaires. We would never have these rich descriptions of why people volunteer if you are just ticking one to seven. I go to the football match or I volunteer because I get free tickets. Yes, I'm not, not true at all. Seven, yes, definitely true. And then you take one out of seven. And you range all these different things. You wouldn't have this description. And then based on these des description, it's easier for us to understand how or why these uh, um, people do volunteer. So one of our main findings, I would say, is that the clubs, the football clubs, they are home for a huge diversity of people. All kinds of people volunteer. You can't say that, okay, they are there for their, because it's, they want to put it on their CV. Quite opposite, actually. All of those 16 that we interviewed, at least, it could be a coincidence, but all those we interviewed said, no, I would not put this on my CV. It wouldn't matter for them. So they are there for different reasons. But the clubs are home to a very uh, diverse group of people. So there's a variety of people and the club or the community here is very heterogeneous. You can express different identities without exposing yourself. You don't have to be like this. There's a she's a volunteer, she's a she's a, a steward at the at the terraces, but at the same time she is obviously a, a supporter or a fan. And then you have others. In the restaurant, they are not necessarily seeing the match. But they are still there because they want to com contribute. So for many of these people, this event is a social arena for people outside the workforce. Either they are retired or they, ha they are having some uh, they are retired for different reasons, either for age or, or uh, it could be because they have some sort of social benefits or whatever, whatever. But there is a, it seems to be an arena for people outside the workforce. So what we did, just to sum up, when we, when we talked about these volunteers, we, we divided them into at least this material, we divided them into th three different groups or categories. We had those where we we call them the follower volunteer, or it could be the sa fan or the supporter, but those recruited from from their interests of the game and especially this team so they they had their interest they were supporters of the team and then you had um, what we call the club veteran they had a many of these had a, a rather long long experience within the club doing different kinds of, of voluntary work And then we had I can't talk and write at the same time. I'm a man. Community volunteers. These were those who reason their activity based on I we wanted to contribute it's nice for the city it's important for the city to have this team and we want to contribute so they they um, 
at least these three groups were identified within our material as something they, they sort of crystal themselves out in a bit but if you did other interviews in a larger group with other sports for instance or you might find other other groups of volunteers or they explain their activity in different ways okay I spent more than the 15 minutes I said I would uh, the rector hasn't called me yet so uh, but I think I uh, I think I have to run um, I'm very sorry for your break um, they, will have it they will have it now okay so do you have any questions for me on this I, I'm very sorry that it was very quick and brief because I could spend more time with this but if you have some questions um, if not then uh, 15, minutes. 15 minutes break okay Eight past half. Eight past half, yeah. <laughs>